Well, tonight, author Leslie Rule joins me on the show to talk about some notoriously haunted locations and some of her personal experiences visiting haunted locations as covered in her latest book, Haunted in America, on this episode of Passion for the Paranormal. Well, greetings, fellow truth seekers, and welcome once again to Passion for the Paranormal, bringing a passion for the paranormal to you. I'm your host, Curry Stegan, and uh, as always, it's really good to be back here with you once again, and uh, got a very exciting announcement, getting ready to, uh, for the upcoming release of my first book, Walking in the Shadows of Strangers, which will be available for pre-order soon, uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, both on my website at Passion, the number four, theparanormal.com, and on the uh, Facebook page at Passion, uh, I'm sorry, Facebook.com slash Passion, the number four, the paranormal. Uh, so very excited about that. Uh, and I'm also excited to have Leslie joining me. She has been writing uh, about ghost stories for a very long time. And uh, so her latest book is kind of an encapsulation of her favorite ghost stories. So uh, really looking forward to having her on the show and talking with her. And uh, whatever podcast app you happen to be using out there, and uh, we're pretty much on all of them, please do something simple and make sure you hit that subscribe button. And also copy uh, that link to the show and share it out with any friends, family members, co-workers you think that would like to check out the show. And uh, without further ado, um, I'm really eager to get into discussion with Leslie. I love talking about ghost stories, and hopefully all of you love to hear about great ghost stories as well. Uh, she's a great author, and so uh, I'm going to get into this discussion, and uh, thank you so much for tuning into the show. Okay, so uh, joining me tonight is Leslie Rule, and uh, Leslie is an artist, photographer, and author. Her true crime debut, A Tangled Web, was released in April of 2020 and covers a frightening Omaha love triangle murder. She is a veteran author of over three decades, uh, and her works include two suspense novels and five nonfiction books on my favorite topic, the paranormal, including Coast to Coast Ghosts, True Stories of Hauntings Across America, and her latest book, Haunting in America, Haunted in America, which covers the very best ghost stories she has written about. In addition to her best-selling books, Leslie has published dozens of articles in national magazines to include First for Women, Women's World, and Reader's Digest. Leslie, it's uh, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, I can't think of a, a funner topic and more exciting topic to talk about than uh, ghost stories and hauntings. And uh, it's uh, it's always fun to cover that on on this show. I cover a lot of different topics. Uh, love talking about ghost stories and hauntings. But uh, let's hear it from you. Um, I know that uh, there was a reason you got into this. Everybody seems to have one. Uh, I know there was a reason why you started writing about ghost stories and hauntings across America. But uh, how did this uh, take us back and tell us how this came about? and how you got into this crazy business of writing about ghosts and hauntings. Well, I've always found it fascinating, and I actually grew up in a haunted house. So I never doubted the existence of ghosts, uh, but I wanted to see real proof. So I decided to attempt to write my first ghost book. I started it in the late 1990s with the idea that I wanted to prove to myself that they really exist. And I figured the best way to do that was first to find uh, multiple people who had seen the same apparitions at a particular haunted spot, like a hotel. And also I wanted to try something that had been done just a little bit, but um, nobody seemed to have delved very deeply into it. And that was to find historical events lost in archives, things that were forgotten, that would match what was being seen. So if people were seeing a little girl with long blonde braids, I would search through news archives until I found an account of a child that looked like that who died in or near the premises. And I wasn't even sure if it would work, but 
I was actually pretty successful in in finding stories, not in every case, but in many cases. And to me, that was validating to actually find something. Now, when I started doing this, it wasn't easy to find old news stories because things were not online. Um, I don't even know if anyone I knew had email when I started uh, researching this. And so I had to fly across the country to whatever haunted place I was researching and then go to whatever archives the city had available. Um, sometimes they were in libraries, sometimes they were in newspaper offices, and very seldom was everything cataloged. Sometimes like libraries would have a uh, general cataloging of really major events, but there was a lot of digging, a lot of just scrolling through old newspaper articles, trying to find something. Now, you, can, you don't even have to get off the couch. I subscribe to a number of archival databases of newspapers. You can research millions, literally millions of newspaper articles just with a tap of your finger. And you can take a screenshot of it. Back then, you had to have a librarian help you thread the microfiche into the machine. And uh, it was kind of an arduous process. The light bulb would burn out, and you'd have to get it, work really hard to get everything lined up just right. And it was such a luxury to write Haunted in America and do the updates because I didn't have to go anywhere. And so <laughs> I revisited a lot of the stories that I written years ago. Um, the last ghost book had come out in, it was 2009, so it had been quite a few years. And I ended up doing updates on most of the stories, and I found new things to explain what was being seen. Now, Leslie, you're dating yourself there. You mentioned the microfish. <laughs> yes, well, I'm almost 65, so, um, and I'm not embarrassed to admit it. I'm, I'm proud of every year I've lived. I, I remember the those best days, generation. So. I, I feel like people my age, born in the 50s, grew up in the 60s and 70s, I kind of feel like that we had a good handle on things and we helped to change the world in a lot of really positive ways. Yeah, I remember the microfishes. I remember doing research when I was in college using microfish. So I'm dating myself as well. well so <laughs> you look very young. I would not think you were a day over 40. Wow, that's nice of you to say that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you're an no, old I guy do, too. I do remember <laughs> microfishes and I remember those days. And I still remember when the internet first came out. So yeah. I think we're both dating ourselves here. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad that I grew up in an era when we weren't distracted by electronics. You could walk down the street and meet somebody, meet people, talk to people. And now people are like glued to their cell phones and they're not noticing what's going on around them. They're missing a lot of ghosts. Yeah, they're almost running into things as they're looking down at their phones walking on the street, you know, and uh, it, it, yeah, it's it's a different day and age for sure. Uh, do you find it harder to write about it now when there's already so many people out there writing about ghost stories and hauntings? Well, in, with Haunted in America, there are about 100 pages of new stories, but I was mostly revisiting um, the older stories because I have uh, four nonfiction books of ghost stories that I was drawing from. I, I did not find it difficult. I didn't really feel I had competition because I worked with the same publisher with the ghost books for years. And they asked me to, to do this, to do this compilation. So I, I already knew I had a market for it and I already knew I, I had readers. And the books had done really well in the past. So that was not difficult. I can't wait to get out there again and go to brand new places and hear new stories. I now, love talking to people about what they've seen. Now, what uh, led you into this? I think there was mentioned somewhere in the book that uh, you lived in a haunted house. Is that true? I grew up in a haunted house in Des Moines, Washington, um, Puget Sound. It was on a, a windy cliff, 
And we were so close to the water that on stormy days, the sprays of water would hit our windows. And my dad had actually grown up in the same house. And we moved there when I was about five. My parents purchased the house from my grandparents. And my parents were very matter of fact about the, the fact that the house was haunted. And so to me, uh, to, I, I, I'm actually shocked when people tell me they don't believe in ghosts. That's puzzling to me because to me, they've always been part of my life. Uh, I've always known of their existence, even if I've re rarely seen them in my life. I think that when our parents believe something, as kids, we tend to believe it too and just accept it as natural. Um, my parents would talk about when they were remodeling the house, they would go there on the weekends and get the house ready for us to move in. And they would hear the phone ring persistently. It would ring and ring and ring and they would walk to the wall where the old fashioned phone had once been mounted. The phone was no longer there. It was long gone. It had been thrown away. There were just a few wires sticking out of the wall and wires don't ring. And they, they'd listen, they'd look at each other and they figured it was my great grandfather who they told us was our ghost. Uh, so I actually was comforted by that when I was a child. And I had a sense that he was watching over us. And there was, but there was also something dark. There was something scary. I'm not sure if it was um, just being a child and watching all the scary movies and, and having, um, even though my parents didn't make me afraid, that was the culture. We're supposed to be afraid of ghosts. So something made me uncomfortable there. Um, I don't know, again, if it was imagination or if there really was something dark there, but it was built on a Native American graveyard. Um, that whole area, it was a graveyard, an old graveyard. And we had a sobbing ghost who could be heard throughout the neighborhood. That was, it was very chilling. I heard it one time. So um, I've never completely gotten to the bottom of exactly what was going on at that site. Today, it's a park called Overlook Park. And it um, it's Des Moines, Washington, right above the marina. So it'd be interesting to go back there and, and do some more in-depth research. Yeah, absolutely. Uh... I was, uh, I guess I was one of those who came into the paranormal without having my own paranormal experiences. And uh, I guess I wanted to find out for myself, was there some truth to this? Yeah. And I think that's the case for a lot of us, right? We just want to know, hey, <laughs> yeah. is there really something to this? There's a lot of people that shared stories with me. And, uh, you know, I wanted some validation that, uh, you know, they didn't seem like crazy people to me. Uh, but a lot of people just like you actually have had experiences. Uh, now, did you actually, Leslie, did you see a ghost at the location? Did you actually see an apparition? Not at that location. The most intense experience I had there was when I was about 12 and I heard the sobbing. I was in my basement bedroom and I was reading, I was on the bed and I thought it was my sister. And it sounded like something horrible had happened. It was absolutely anguish sobbing. And my instinct was to jump up. And I, it sounded like it was right, right out in the hall. So I ran out to the hallway. Nobody was there. And at that point, it seemed to have moved a little bit. And I, where is she? I was looking around. I went from room to room. And I ran all through the house. And it always, the crying always seemed to be one room away. And I would say this probably went on for 30 seconds. And then it just kind of faded. It was gone. And it turned out my sister wasn't home. My brothers were playing basketball in the backyard. And I found my mom in the kitchen. She was making dinner. She hadn't been crying, no tears. And I found out later that the crying had been heard throughout the neighborhood. And it was most frequently heard at a house up the street on 6th Avenue. 
And the family who lived there, his name was Smith. It's not a pseudonym. That was their real name. But they would hear every night as it started to get dark in the field behind their house, a faint crying. And the later and the darker it got, the louder it became. And it was accompanied by what sounded like bones crunching and jars rolling. And the neighbor, Sandy Smith, came down one Saturday and asked my mom, will you come with me and look, see what it might be that's making that sound? Because there was a cellar uh, that they didn't really go into. It was a rental and it wasn't like a like a rec room, like a big basement. It was just a little cellar area. And my mom said, sure, I'll go with you. Maybe there's an animal or something down there. So when they got ready to go in, they tried to get the dog to go in. And the dog would not go over the threshold. It stood there as hackles went up. And as you, I'm sure you're aware, the animals are very sensitive to uh, ghostly activity. And they went in, they found nothing. They found just a cleanly swept floor. Uh, no sign that anything had been in there. And my mom had spoken to, to other neighbors too who had heard this crying. It's almost like someone's heart was just breaking. Wow. Yeah, that's that's kind of sad to think about that because you wonder what the story is behind it. And I may have I may have found it um, just actually long after that book came out. I was there was a show in Seattle called Northwest Afternoon. It was their afternoon um, talk show. And I was on several times on a Halloween show and one year we arranged to have um my friend who's a well-known psychic nancy meyer and she had been mentioned in some of my ghost books she can actually read a crime photo she's worked with police to solve crimes and has been very successful at this so we arranged to have her on the show with me is a live show and she was on the phone and this was before Skype and Zoom, so you couldn't see her. It was just a, a phone call. And we had her open the pictures I sent her while we were on the air. And she opened up the picture and saw the photo of the side of my childhood home. And she says, I hear crying. She said, I, there's a woman there and she's crying because she lost her child. And she said, the child didn't die. It was taken away from her because uh, authorities felt it, that she was too young to take care of it. And I later discovered, it was probably a couple of years after that, that uh, right next door to the house, the Sandy Smith's house, was this cool old funky house. When I was growing up, it was sort of kind of a hippie haven and hippies who made pottery lived there. But years ago, it had been um, an orphanage called Daddy Draper's Home for Children. And I just a few weeks ago learned um, that the Drapers moved there from another state with um, a number of children. And the authorities there didn't want them to take the children, but the Drapers did not like the way authorities were handling things. And one of the issues they had was that authorities were taking children away from mothers. And I saw, I read a newspaper article that actually mentioned a young mothers. And so that fit what Nancy said. So it, it made me wonder if uh, one of the orphans perhaps belonged to a young woman. Maybe she passed away and maybe she was there looking for the child. Now, I can never say for certain that's what the case was, but I thought it was very interesting that those things came together, that Nancy Meyer would say that the ghost was looking for her child who'd been taken away from her, and then here's the Draper Orphanage, and they had that, dealt with that very uh, problem. So I thought it kind of tied it up in a neat little bow. Whether or not I come to the right conclusions, I don't know, but I found it fascinating. That's interesting that uh, you uh, were able to get that background, though, that that uh, certainly could tie into that that whole haunting. So, yeah, that's that's interesting because a lot of these kinds of hauntings, most people are left scratching their head. I mean, they don't really yeah. know what the 
what the reasoning is behind it. And some people just run the other direction. So, yes. <laughs> of course, they never find out. Uh, yeah, you know, if you're running uh, away, you're not going to learn very much. Yeah, yeah, I tend to go in the direction where it's happening. <laughs> but I guess that's what you do when you're a paranormal investigator. You want to go find out or sure. at least try to find out what's happening. Uh, Leslie, talk a little bit about your motivation for wanting to write about this. What what really what really makes you uh, like writing about these ghost stories? What really drives you or, or um, I guess inspires you to write these? Well, I have, I don't think that the idea of ghosts is scary. I think it's very reassuring. And any proof we can find that shows us that life goes on, I think that's a great thing. I don't understand why people are so afraid of the idea, especially as I get older and, you know, like I said, I'm almost 65 and who knows how much longer I'll be around. Maybe I'll be here in 30 years, but most likely no. And I love the idea that there's more. Now, I don't think that in my, what what I lean toward, um, I, I, I don't have all the answers, but I lean toward the idea that when we die, we, we go somewhere else, but that some spirits are stuck as the uh, leading theory among parapsychologists. And that's where we usually see the ghostly activity. So I don't believe that I will be a stuck spirit, but um, I, I hope that I would move on and go to a, a greater place. But I find it very interesting because we can't really study the spirits that have moved on, but the ones who are stuck tend to give us the most answers from where you and I are right now, from what we can see. We can sense and and um, record EVP or maybe get some pictures or record the electromagnetic activity and the cold spots and all those things. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point that kind of baffles me because I often wonder either are we um, dealing with disincarnate spirits, spirits that are trapped, or are they simply able to come and visit uh, from the other side whenever they want? I don't have that answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what, what I have heard from a number of um, really talented psychics and just from reading and talking to people that I lean toward the idea that the spirit, such as maybe grandma had a great life and she died and she's not trapped, but she comes back when you need her or to reassure you or to say goodbye, but that she's free to go. Where a spirit that was so shocked by their death might not even realize they're dead, could remain in a, a particular spot for a while. Now, I also think like people lately, this has been coming up in conversation. People have been saying, well, that's really pretty terrible that somebody could be trapped there for 100 years. But I think that we're thinking in terms of our world and what time is to us, like what 100 years would feel like to us. I think that in the on the other side, time does not even exist. So if somebody uh, sees a ghost, of someone who died a hundred years earlier at a particular location, the, for instance, the, the sobbing ghost that was seen in my neighborhood, it doesn't mean that somebody has really suffered for that long period of time. To them, it might just be a blink of an eye. And I also think it's very possible that you can move backward and forward in time on the other side. Yeah, just you know, that's going a one direction. Yeah, that's a good point because it begs the question. Uh, I think you make a good point there because otherwise, why are we seeing ghosts from such distant past? Uh, I mean, if if you look at places like Gettysburg, where you know this the one of the biggest Civil War battles of all time happened, and people are seeing apparitions of soldiers there, and uh, you know they're hearing, uh, and and you know some of it may just be imprints they're hearing gunshots, cannon fire, 
you know, that sort of thing. That happened such a very long time ago, at least from our perspective. Yes. From our time perspective. Now, to them, like you said, um, perhaps they're moving in and out of time uh, different times, and uh, they don't have the same concept of time. And that, that's, a, that's an interesting aspect of it, because I've heard the same thing from psychics and mediums, that time really does not exist on that other side. So what we see is a long time ago may not seem like a long time ago to a spirit. Right. Perhaps. Um, and there's also the possibility that, and this is again hard for us to wrap our minds around because of the world we live in, but perhaps on the other side, someone could be in two places at once. So they may be a stuck spirit that we can see, and maybe they may also be a spirit that's moved on. It's yeah. a hard concept yeah. to, to really wrap our, our minds around, but we have to kind of get out of the idea that the world is the way it is as we see it, where things can be measured and time goes in one direction, which yeah, and is really fun to contemplate. It is. It, 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 it also baffles the mind. And uh, if you've looked at or you've read about near-death experiences, uh, that seems to be part of many of people's near-death experiences, too, is that time just kind of goes away. Uh, they really don't seem yes. to, you know, and that seems to be, I don't know if I, I guess I, if I dare say this, maybe it's kind of a consistent theme to a lot of people who have had near-death experiences. Now, not I'm not a researcher of the subject, so I can't say that's the truth for sure. I know that it has come up in different near-death experience or cases that they've mentioned that uh, there's really no kind of, there's no, no concept of time kind of goes away. So that's, that's uh, interesting because perhaps they just don't have any concept of it on that, on that other side. Yes. Yeah. Let's get into, so the book, there's some really, really interesting haunted locations listed in there. Um, there's many uh, and some are well known. Uh, they've been covered in uh, paranormal shows uh of you know more than one types of paranormal shows i know uh, a few of them that you have uh, in the book that you talk about and then there's some others that i've never heard about uh some of them are more you know um hauntings of homes and of families and and that sort of thing so how did you come up with this list and talk about how you kind of came or put this list together and you know how that process kind of worked well when i when I did the books originally, I sought out cases that were not well known because I wanted something new. Now, a lot this was before paranormal TV shows were I don't even know if there were any at that time like when the first book came out in 2001. So a lot of the TV shows, they get their ideas from authors books. So sometimes after I wrote about something, now it's well known, but it was not known at the time I wrote about it. So I still try to do that. I still try to find something that everyone hasn't read about. And if it is something place that it's a popular haunted spot that everyone knows about, I look for a new story. I look for a new sighting of an apparition or a new historical event that was powerful that might be influencing the haunting. To me, it's it's I just don't want to rehash something that everybody's already seen and heard. Like with the Queen Mary is a, said to be one of the most haunted places in the world is uh, in Long Beach, California, is the the famous ship that was uh, made by the Canard White Star Line. They the White Star actually uh, built the Titanic. And of course, everybody knows the story of the Titanic, a horrible tragedy that occurred. And 20 years later, they launched the Queen Mary, 10% bigger than, than the Queen Mary, and designed to be very, very safe because people were a little bit nervous. And she had a fascinating history, went from England to New York um, many years, 1936, I think it was 1960s when she retired, and now is in a man-made lagoon tethered to one spot and is a hotel, restaurant, and museum. People can actually go stay there. And you'll see a lot of uh, 
paranormal shows that covered the Queen Mary. Um, I was really interested in a sighting I learned about on an old unsolved mystery show. It was a woman by the name of Carol Layden, and she was interviewed for the show about an uh, apparition she had seen in the restaurant where she worked on the ship. And she described a woman with um, wearing her hair with the braids coiled up the sides of her head and an old time outfit. And she thought she was an alive real person. And she appeared in her section early in the morning and she brought coffee over. And as she walked away, she turned to get another glimpse at her because she was so interesting and the woman was no longer there. And I wanted to find out if I could, could look, look for a historical event that could explain who that particular ghost was. And I got it in my head that maybe a woman had vanished from the ship. And I somehow thought I could find a story about that. It took three or four days, even with the going through the um, online databases of the news archives. I searched and I searched and I searched. And after a few days, I finally found it. And really, it was a big event. And I'm surprised it hasn't surfaced before. But I haven't found any other paranormal book. I haven't found um, any mention of this in a documentary. But in the year 1936, a young woman by the name of Jane Carey, she was 20 years old. Uh, she had been studying abroad for a year. Uh, she lived in, in Lynn, Massachusetts, and she was on her way home. And uh, from she was on the Queen Mary traveling from Southampton, um, England to New York. And halfway there, early on a foggy Sunday morning, she vanished from the ship. And so I dug into her story a little bit and I, I found some some fascinating things to add to the mystery. Um, I won't go into all that now, but the interesting thing is in the, all the photos I've seen of her, she had those braids coiled up on the side of her head, like the, um, the apparition that Carol Layden had seen. And once I found Jane's story, I really wanted to talk to Carol to see if she recognized her. So I looked her up and I was sad to see that she's passed away a few years ago. So I didn't get to talk to Carol about this. But I think there's a strong possibility that the ghost she saw was Jane. Jane, nobody has figured out what's happened to her. She disappeared and was never seen again. And she also, the night before she disappeared, uh, she was seen dancing. And one of the ghosts who's seen aboard the Queen Mary is a dancing ghost, a woman in a white dress. And it's occurred to me that may also be Jane. But that was a real find for me because I wanted that juicy little story that nobody knew that people had read a thousand times before or already seen on TV. There are a number of different apparitions seen on the Queen Mary, but I think it's very possible that one of the uh, female ghosts seen there is actually Jane Carey. She would be a great candidate for a ghost just because of the unresolved issues. On um, the morning she disappeared, she should have been on her way to breakfast. And her cabin mate left for a few minutes and when she came back, Jane wasn't there. And at first she thought maybe she'd gone swimming, but she was never seen again. So they have, cast. to this day, have not solved that mystery. It's never been solved. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. She lived in, um, her family lived in a mansion in, in Lynn, Massachusetts. She was an heiress and uh, she, she loved the Italian language and had been studying in Italy, a Smith College student. She was actually the third Smith College student to disappear in, in a, a short amount of time. I believe it was about a decade. And the other two had vanished on Friday the 13th. In her case, it was that was not it was not the 13th, but um, it's it's kind of interesting that three different students 
from Smith College just inexplicably disappeared. So that was something the newspapers at the time pointed out was she was the third one. And I actually, in my research, discovered that females vanishing from ships was very common during that time. And the authorities, they wanted to write it off as suicide. And I think it's possible, strongly, strong possibility that there was a serial killer who was um, e either employed by one of the ships or by a number of the ships and went from ship to ship and took victims. So I think it's possible that a serial killer or serial killers was kill killing women on these ships because so many of them vanished. And in Jane's case, the authorities wanted to say it was a suicide in the first uh, Newspaper articles that appeared said heiress leaps from ship. Nobody saw that happen. There was no note. There was nothing to suggest that it was a suicide, but it would have been very bad for business if people became afraid and thought that women were being victimized. But think about it back then. There weren't security cameras like there are today. And, and even today, uh, women are disappearing from ships. But back in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, there were so many of them. And some of them probably were suicides. There were notes and there was depression, but there were many instances where they seemed to have everything going for them. They were happy and they just simply vanished with no explanation. Yeah, it's a, that's a scary thought. Um, and uh, back in those days, uh, like you said, it wasn't as easy to solve those kinds of cases as it is nowadays. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it is it is kind of sad to think about. Um, I wanna talk about some of the locations you, you obviously have covered a lot. You've written about a lot. What are some of the creepiest ones you've written about and researched? Um, possibly the St. James Hotel in Cimarron, New Mexico. Um, I may have had an encounter with a little ghost, two and a half years old, by the name of Johnny Lambert. I stayed in the hotel with my friend Sherry, a fellow writer, quite a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago, for, I think he's, I believe he's in Coast to Coast Ghost. So it would have been late 1990s when I stayed there. And we had some odd things happening during the night. I slept through most of it, but uh, my friend was, she was afraid. She was afraid of the idea of ghosts. I wasn't, I really want, was hoping I'd see one, uh, but she couldn't sleep and she was lying in bed and she looked up and she saw, um, there's a transom window over the, the door like they have in the old hotels. Suddenly it was lit up and the room across, across the hall, a light had gone on in the room and then she heard pacing outside of the door and then it just stopped. And when I finally woke up, she tried for a while to get me to wake up. I think at that point, the light had gone out and she couldn't figure out how that had happened. And I said, well, probably just burned out. So I, I walked across the hall and it had been physically turned off. And I said, well, maybe someone's playing a trick on us. And she, after the light went off, she heard no footsteps. And it's a very creaky hallway. And I said, well, maybe they turned it off and then snuck away. But I, I could not walk on that hall without making noise because it was such old wood. And so that was pretty mysterious. And I went back to sleep and it was about dawn. I came wide awake. I had the sensation of a little hand touching my face. And I didn't see anything, but I felt that it woke me up. And we started talking about, again, it was another Unsolved Mysteries uh, episode where a witness had described seeing the ghost of a little boy on the bar. 
and it was in the morning and it was he was a new employee and he uh, looked into the bar and he saw a kid sitting there spinning a bottle and he walked into the bar and he said hey kid uh, you're not supposed to be down here and get back to your room and the kid jumped off the bar and vanished into the floor and I said well let's go I said to my friend Sherry, let's go to the cemetery and see if we can figure out if there was a little boy who lived here who died. So we went to the old cemetery and we found the Lambert family plot. The Lamberts were the family that everybody knew had owned the hotel years before, and they were believed to be um, some of the ghosts that were there. And I found the, a gravestone for Johnny Lambert died in the 1890s at two and a half and my friend said oh well that can't be him because unsolved mysteries showed an older boy and i said well maybe they took creative license i want to talk to the kid that actually saw the ghost so after i got back home to seattle i did a little research and i and i couldn't track down the actual witness but i found his father and he said my son does not like to talk about it. It scared him very badly and he, he quit. He would not go back there and he won't talk about it. And even though he was interviewed for the Unsolved Mystery Show, and he said, but I will tell you exactly what he told me. He said the, um, the child was a little boy, little. And I said, you mean like a toddler? And he said, yes. And he had long blonde curly hair and he was wearing a white nightgown and he was spinning this bottle. And when his son approached him and reprimanded him and told him to go back to his room, the kid looked up and half of his face was disfigured as if he'd been burned. And that's when he leapt off the counter and vanished into the floor. And there had actually been other accounts of employees there seeing a little blonde figure out of the corner of their eye and they'd be vacuuming and they'd see a little blonde figure and then the vacuum would be unplugged. And I think it's very possible uh, that that was Johnny. And this is when I mentioned my friend, Nancy Meyer earlier, I hired her to read some of the photos in the book, including um, photos of the St. James Hotel. And she picked up on the children. She picked up on a little boy. She said, um, his name is something like Joe. Um, she didn't say Johnny, but um, she described him and she said that he was, he was in an accident and he was running around in the kitchen and somebody was carrying a pot of fried food and he ran into them and they were burned and so was he. And Nancy didn't know this, but Johnny Lambert's father was the chef at the hotel. He had once cooked for Abraham Lincoln. So, and Nancy also didn't know that the ghost that I was researching lived at the hotel. So for her to pick up on something like that, that was, that was pretty specific. And she also said that, um, that there were children who died in the late 1800s, 1890s of diphtheria. And at the time Coast to Coast ghost came out, I wasn't able to find the cause of death for Johnny, uh, even though I sent away for the records. This was before the computer thing, so I had to go through the mail and send a check and took about six weeks and I got a letter back saying they could find nothing. But recently, when I was doing my updates, I searched newspaper archives until I finally did discover that Johnny did have diphtheria, which was the... Um, the disease that she'd uh, zeroed in on. And he did die as in the 1890s. So I find her to be extremely accurate. Um, she says about 90% of the time she's accurate. Now, no psychic medium is completely accurate. They're getting information that they have to, um, they have to analyze it and they're not always sure what it means. Like if a psychic medium is seeing the color blue, it could be someone's name is Mrs. Blue, or it could be the color blue. So they have the task of trying to decipher the information and make sense of it. But she seems to be very accurate about a number of the things that she's told me over the years. So I've, I've been pretty impressed with her. 
So that was kind of creepy, just being in that whole old, old hotel and feeling that little hand touch my face. I wasn't afraid, but it was still kind of creepy. Yeah, I think the St. James Hotel, uh, you know, I visited and, and investigated different locations in four to, across four different states. Uh, St. James is definitely one on my list I'd like to visit. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure I would ever be able to investigate there. It's a hotel. People are staying there. But, uh, you know, maybe there's a haunted room that you can book, get booked or some of the more notoriously known haunted rooms. Was that the case for you? Yeah. They have one room that they will not let anybody stay in. I forget what number it is, but every time someone stayed in that room, disaster would strike. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it was so bad that they no longer allowed anyone to stay in that room. And if you look on YouTube and you look for um, stories about the St. James Hotel, uh, there's news reporters interviewing them about that and the fact that they won't. They won't rent that room out. At the time that I covered the story, the um, owners and management were completely open to ghost researches and being written about. I don't know what the status is of that now, uh, but I would assume that they still like that because it can be really good for business that when you have a haunted hotel. It can be good or bad. <laughs> they also have a newer wing that I don't think has any ghostly activity. Oh, well, wow. interesting. Yeah, so uh, Leslie, you were kind of doing some, uh, if you want to call it ghost hunting, uh, before ghost hunting was cool. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't a hobby yet. It was, um, I got a lot of weird looks when I was researching ghosts starting in the 1990s, but um, the, everything has changed now. It used to be the only time people wanted to talk about ghosts on the radio, or of course there weren't podcasts then, was October. That was the only time I was popular. The rest yeah. of the year I was in that. Yeah, Halloween. Now you talk Everybody about wants it. To, to tell creepy stories and ghost stories and all that kind of good stuff. All right, so uh, let's get into some a few of these locations. All right, um, you have several that you mentioned in the new book. There's actually there's a whole bunch of them. I want to ask about Elms Resort, Excelsior Springs, M Missouri. This yeah. sounds eerily like another location I've covered on this show, and that is the Crescent Hotel. Uh -huh. uh, in, uh, it's in Arkansas. It's actually Eureka Springs, Arkansas. It sounds eerily similar to that location in a lot of ways. I've always wanted to go to the Crescent. I haven't been there yet, but... Excelsior Springs, uh, th there's kind of a nice ambiance there. I didn't have anything scary happen when I was there, nothing spooky, but it is an extremely active site, and I spoke to a number of people who did have experiences there. Now, um, Excelsior Springs at one time was a resort town. People would come from all over the country, people with serious illness, many of them dying, because it was believed that the waters there had healing powers. And that was the town's business. They bottled the water there and sold it. Uh, people flocked in droves. And a few years later, I think it was in the 1960s, a uh, magazine debunked it. And once word got out that the water did not really have healing power, everything fell apart. And so, um, most of the hotels had to close down, but Excelsior Springs, um, the Elms Resort, is owned by the city, and it's it's a pleasant place. I I enjoyed going there. Um, some of the things that happen there are kind of creepy, though. They hear children running up and down the hallways. There was a fifth grade class on a field trip, and they were on, I think it was the second floor, and every kid in the class claimed that they saw a little girl run past them and disappear into the wall. I searched archives for two weeks trying to figure out who that little girl was, but the records were not very good. 
not very specific for that area. The fact that so many people went to Excelsior Springs, specifically the Elms Hotel for healing. They had pools there and the um, people would go for the water therapy. That indicates that a lot of people also died there. Some people got out of their deathbeds to go there. And some people actually improved, but it might have been the placebo effect. They believed they were going to get better. But I really wanted to figure out who that little girl was. But I couldn't find anything specific about a child dying there. I found plenty of of instances of adults. Um, One guy uh, dropped dead in the lobby. Uh, The other thing that occurred was during a period in the 1970s, I I can't remember exactly what decade it was, but there was a period of time when the hotel was closed down. And when I walked around the neighborhood, I spoke to some people who had lived there all their lives. And they said, when we were kids, we used to play in there, crawl through the broken windows and, uh, one of them actually saw a maid pushing a cart through the rubble. She wasn't there. She was an apparition. Wow. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. Um, these these areas where there's springs, there does seem to be a lot of them where there's reported paranormal activity. So it begs the question is, uh, are these locations uh, similar to the Crescent Hotel I mentioned in uh, Eureka Springs, uh, where there's a lot of lime and quartz? Uh, and uh, there is a theory that places where there's heavy lime and quartz deposits in the ground seems to be some sort of uh, some sort of uh, beacon for paranormal activity, yeah. if you will. And, yeah, I like that. Uh, yeah, and I'm just wondering if you kind of have the same. It sounds like you might have I, the same kind of. I've heard so. that. I don't have any proof of that, but I think it's a really interesting idea to explore. Yeah, it it certainly does make you wonder if it if it's kind of acts as a conduit for yeah. for uh, you know the unexplained or the paranormal. Or... Yeah, I think water seems to influence ghostly activity. I can't tell you how, but um, there seems to be a lot of haunted places near water. Now, that could also be because places with water tend to be uh, have more history because people build near the water first. So there would be uh, more life and death there. So that could explain some of it. But I think there's a lot we don't understand yet. Yeah, there's another... Uh famous location a uh, haunted location that you re- that you write about or cover in the new book and that's the uh, limp mansion and the limp mansion was a, a brewery at one time or yes yeah a family that owned the brewery a very famous brewery and uh, there's a story of the monkey boy what's the what's the story there uh- well, the monkey boy is a legend and nobody has actually been able to prove his existence and i i, I searched archives could find no record of him. But the story was that Billy Lemp um, had an affair with a maid and they had a child with disabilities and neighbors claimed that he was peering out of the attic windows at them. They saw, they said he looked like a, a monkey. I don't know if that's really true, but it's kind of a creepy idea. Um, I, I think that the Lemp, family are the most likely ghosts there. Uh, several of them committed suicide in 1904, 1922, and 1949. Um, th- the le- three of the lamps, a father, a son, and then another son actually died there. And their apparitions have been seen around the mansion. Um, it's, it's also a restaurant. It's a restaurant, um, a ho- hotel, they put on uh, murder mystery dinners, and one early morning, a waitress was in the restaurant, and they weren't yet open, and she looked over, and she saw a guy sitting at a table. It's kind of like what happened on the Queen Mary, because he she approached with coffee, and she asked him a question, and he ignored her, and she thought he was lost in thought, but then he vanished. Wow. Wow. That's, uh, that was probably it's, it's... one of the limps. 
Yeah, and that's that's a kind of a creepy thing to think about that, you know, was there some sort of conditions at the location that drove these people to suicide, these family members? It just it's just kind of a creepy thing to think about. Uh-huh. And that uh, three different family members took their own lives. It was possibly a genetic predisposition toward depression. And, you you know, nowadays we have medicine. We have stuff we can take when we get depressed. I take something. Um, half the people I know take something. But they didn't have that available. My uncle committed suicide in the 1950s. There was no, no medication for him. So I think we saw a lot more suicides that could have been prevented in the past before there was medication. And we would see a lot more now if if there wasn't the medication. There's still too much, but um, there's things we can do about it now. But it takes can take a very long time for somebody to find the right medication for them. And it doesn't mean you're weak. If if you're depressed and you can't get, snap out of it, it's a chemical imbalance. So, and I don't have any, I'm not embarrassed to say that I take, that I have depression and anxiety and that I take medication for it because I figure if it helps one person who is not feeling well, if it helps them feel reassured that other people feel it and there is something they can do about it, then it's worth it. I I wanted to talk about another location. Uh, Well, wait, before I do that, let me back up. There is a story of you riding a haunted roller coaster in the book. (laughs) (laughs) I got to hear that one. The Blue Streak Roller Coaster at Connie at Lake Park um, is haunted. And unfortunately, the roller coaster is no more um, it. During COVID, the um, business was, it just couldn't stay afloat any longer. It was owned by the community and they just couldn't, they could not survive through COVID because business was so bad. So the park was sold and uh, the new owner dismantled the roller coaster. But the Blue Streak was a popular roller coaster for years. And it had been there, of course, since the 1940s. And when I was visiting the park around, I think it was around 2002, I walked all over the park. I like to just walk up to people, employees at haunted places, and ask them, look them right in the eye and say, have you ever seen something? Um, People tend to be more open if you're face to face. And you also can get a sense if somebody's being sincere. If they're pu- pulling your leg or they're really t- t- telling you about what really happened. So I talked to a roller coaster operator who had this experience that really frightened him. Um, he was uh, loading people up, um, helping people out. And when after a ride, a roller coaster, an empty car uh, shot past him and went into this tunnel that they called the skunk tunnel. And it malfunctioned. So he went in there to retrieve it and he saw a little girl standing in the middle of the track and she had, she was glowing and she had a skirt on that like fell to her mid calf. It terrified him and he refused to ever go back, back in that tunnel again. I, I don't think it would terrify me. I think I'd be fascinated. But there, I have had experiences when I was um, 15, I saw goes through a window and I I know that feeling your stomach just drops and it did scare me. It wouldn't terrify me, but it was like, it was my sister's house. It was a rental and she wasn't home. And I was staying there by myself that day. And I went to the store and came back and I saw three figures standing in the living room. I couldn't make out their features. I could just see them. I could see it was a woman and two men and they were in the big picture window, but I know that feeling of your stomach just dropping. It's it's a very odd sensation. So I can understand why he was afraid, especially because when I go to research ghosts, I'm looking for information about them, like you are. We're going toward it. But if somebody 
has not really given much thought to ghosts and maybe don't, don't maybe they don't even believe in ghosts and they suddenly see something i can understand why they're afraid especially after how hard hollywood has worked to make ghosts scary they've made so many frightening movies about ghosts is yeah, it just absolutely. I, it, it it is uh you do have so much hollywoodized versions of yeah. uh haunted stories and uh there's so much play on things like the demonic and and uh like yeah unfortunately I, yeah. It, it does seem to sell to a lot of people uh it doesn't seem to be the reality of the paranormal for me uh, but it does seem to sell it. <laughs> so I think you've touched on something there. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think that does tend to frighten a lot of people. Whereas you and I, maybe uh, we don't kind of view it the same way. No, and I, I understand there's things out there that are evil in the spirit world, just as there are in, the, in our world. Um, but I don't seek out evil places. I don't know anything about demons i don't research them i don't want to know about them if i don't go to a place if i'm hearing there's demon-like activity i just stay away i don't see the point in going there i want to learn about benign hauntings i want to learn about um human beings good human beings who are stuck and find evidence that they actually exist in spare form that's reassuring. That's uplifting. I have no desire to go to frightening places. I don't want to be frightened. I like that eerie feeling and maybe the hairs on the back of your neck go up and a spooky and a chill, but not terror. I don't want that. I don't want darkness. Yeah, I don't think anybody really does want that. Uh, but yeah, there is always the the thrill part of the aspect of doing uh, if you want to call it ghost hunting, I, I like to say paranormal investigating. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There's a thrill aspect to it, but it's just like you said, it's not about going and seeking out bad stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I would never encourage anybody to do that. Uh, whether or not you believe in it or not, I'm not going to go looking for it. And no. I, I have to, I have to agree with you there. Why, you know, tempt, uh, why tempt it? Uh, I mean, I'm not going to do it myself. No. And, uh, and I would not play with a Ouija board. When we were kids, we had one. I got one for Christmas when I was 10. Um, nothing bad happened to us. But after I grew up and started researching ghost stories, I have now spoken to so many people who have had bad experiences with Ouija boards that I warn people to be careful. It. I don't... I would advise people not to try to seek out spirits with a Ouija board. People are going to do whatever they decide they're going to do. They they don't have to listen to me, but I think it would be a disservice to my readers to say it's okay. When Coast to Coast Ghost was published, I had a little sidebar article about the Ouija board, the two different conflicting perspectives on whether they were dangerous or not. And I said it, these are what these experts are saying. It's up to the reader to make up their own mind. And in this new book, I said it's still, I still think the reader should make up their own mind, but it would be unfair if I don't tell you that I have found many, many stories that ended badly of people playing with Ouija boards. So they can still make up their own mind, but I have to put in my two cents and say, beware. You're right. Be careful what you're playing with. Uh, you, you know, you, you may you may stumble across something you don't want to, perhaps. All right. So uh, I want to talk about another location. So I uh, I actually lived in the, in the Denver area for a few years. Um, I noticed you mentioned the Oxford Hotel, Denver, Colorado. Um, and it sounds like uh, from what I've little bit I read, it sounds like a pretty active place. Uh, what did you find out? Uh, I think you've stayed there. Uh, what was your experience? What did you find out about that location? Well, I stayed there with uh, Janice Oberding and Debbie Constantino, the late Debbie Constantino, um, both paranormal investigators. Janice is an author of ghost books, and 
Debbie was an EVP specialist. And De both Debbie and Janice became very frightened while we were staying there. Uh, I was, we were doing two different things. I was spending most of my days at the library researching archives and photographing the various haunted places in town and talking to people uh, while Janice and Debbie were focused on collecting EVP. And they got really spooked. And I was sleeping in a back room and one day they went out and they came home. I was, I was nowhere near the door, but as they were putting the key in the door, they heard footsteps as if someone were inside running away from the door and they opened the door and of course there was no one there and that night debbie became extremely frightened because she could hear the murmuring murmuring voices it sounded like two men and they seemed to be sitting on the couch and i thought it was kind of ironic because she was there to collect evp to try to record ghostly voices yet when she's trying to go to sleep and she doesn't She's not trying to record voices and there's no electronic equipment involved. She hears them and she becomes scared. And what is actually very sad about this too, and I, I did mention it in the book and a lot of people will know who she is. Um, she, she was on one of the really popular ghost shows and became somewhat of a celebrity, but she died in a murder suicide with her husband mark mark um took her life and his own life and the room we were staying in was actually called the murder room and it was the site of a murder suicide that occurred there so it may have been debbie was had a really strong sixth sense and, and i witnessed it I, I saw it a few times and I think this is why she was so successful at collecting EVP because um, she was a sensitive. But I'm thinking it's quite possible that the reason she became so afraid was her destiny was the same as the ghosts who haunted our room. Murder, suicide. Wow. Yeah, that's... that's She's a wonderful quite... person. And I like Mark, too. I like both of them. I took some some tri trips with them and I don't know what happened, but I think they were, I think they were both good people. But um, the rumor I heard was that Mark became addicted to um, opiates from a back in injury. I don't know if that's true, but that can really mess up somebody's brain. And it's, it's tragic. Debbie's, a friend of Debbie's was also shot by Mark. Um, I'm not making excuses for Mark. It was a terrible, terrible thing. Um, but my memory of them was they were likable people. It was very shocking. I didn't learn about it till three years after the fact. We were friends, but they were, you know, at my age, you have friends, sometimes you don't talk to them for five years. You just gather so many over the years. And one day I thought, hmm, I haven't heard from them for a while. So I, I got on YouTube to see if I could see what they were up to. And I said, oh, here I put in EV, put the words EVP and the Constantinos. And a video pops up, and I think it's going to be Debbie collecting EVP. But instead, it's some paranormal investigator, I don't know, trying to contact Debbie. And that's when I realized she's no longer with us. Very sad, very shocking. Yeah. Uh, it certainly is, and and I do remember seeing her on the on the show, and uh, I wanted to. We're, we're kind of getting short on time, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry about uh, your friend's loss, and it 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 truly is a tragic story. I, I wanted to get your take on perhaps what one of I know we're wrapping up here. What's perhaps one of your favorite? locations or most memorable locations you've ever visited as we get ready to wrap up here okay well I'll, I'll i'll tell you about the pike place market now i personally didn't have an experience there but someone very close to me in the 1970s who's asked me to never mention her name in anything i write would we would go 
downtown Seattle and hang out at the market. And we lived in Nimoy in Washington. It was about 45 minutes on the bus. And this, we'd walk around and get strawberry incense and black light posters. And um, it was just a fun place to hang out when we were teens. And she stopped going there because every time she went, she would see somebody who really, really frightened her. And she described her as, it was like an old, old witch. It was an old Native American woman with shawls. And she looked like she was over a century old. And she was mumbling and in kind of a creepy way. And it frightened her so badly. And she would tell me about seeing this woman there. And... I would have been there the same day, walking all around. I would never see this woman. I would always look for her. And and she was in, in my book when I wrote about this, I referred to the my friend as Belinda because she didn't want me to use her name. But um, she would almost be mad, like, well, how could you not see her? She's always there. And I never saw her. And this was, of course, when I was a teenager, years before I researched ghosts. Then years later, when I started doing the research, I discovered that um, people frequently reported seeing the ghost of Princess Angelina, who was the daughter of Chief Self, who Seattle is named for. And she used to frequent that area. And one day I was talking to a group of students at a high school, and um I asked the kids, has anybody here seen a ghost? And one of the kids raised his hand and said, well, I was at the Pike Place Market. And he described the same apparition, the old Native American woman. And he was looking at her and she vanished before his eyes. And I told him about the ghost of Princess Angelina. And he was shocked. You could tell he had not heard that story before. So I thought that was kind of interesting because that was a a fun place to hang out in. It's very haunted. I personally did not see a ghost there, but there really is an interesting energy there. It's been there for so many years. A lot of people have seen apparitions over the years. Interesting. Well, uh, Leslie, uh, like I said, we're short on time here. Um, If you just want to mention where people can find your work, your books, uh, more about you, websites, anything like that uh, you want to share before we finish up here? Well, uh, you should be able to find my book at a number of online stores. Um, most of the Barnes & Noble is carrying both are carrying both Haunted in America and my true crime book, A Tangled Web. Um, Brick and mortar bookstores are going by the wayside, but if you have a favorite bookstore that you frequent, you can call them and ask them if they have my books. And if they don't have them, they'll, I'm sure they'll be glad to order them for you. Okay, great. Well, uh, Leslie, it's been uh, it's been exciting and uh, fun talking with you tonight. Thank you so much for uh, joining me and sharing uh, your experiences and uh, you know uh, stories about these uh, haunted locations so uh, really appreciate it and uh, have a great what's left of the rest of your night thank you